All right. So our next speaker is a longtime security malcontent, early adopter of the not for human consumption defense, and extensive research into the areas of cognition enhancing drugs and lifestyle regimens will be the focus of his talk today. Um, presenting on neurogenic peptides, smart drugs four minute mile, here is Gingerbread. Thank you, sir. Can everybody hear me? Is that gonna work? A little too close? Working? All right. Neurogenic peptides. So, uh, the reason I subtitled this Smart Drugs 4 Minute Mile is that much like the 4 Minute Mile, I think the pharmacological action behind this class of nootropic drugs will go from being the impossible feat that we set as something in the future that'll never be reached to the standard for exemplary performance. Um, uh, neurogenesis, the idea that you can grow more neurons, repair damaged neurons, actually uh, increase the density of your brain has long been considered impossible. The majority of nootropic drugs that we have now are more about augmenting the processes of the brain, much like uh, tuning up a race car. Neurogenic peptides offer a novel approach. And what's really fun about the neurogenic peptides is after a period of experimentation, even if you completely cease any exposure to these drugs, the, the benefits persist. You'll, uh, so let's just, let's go there. So first things first. Haven't you seen me here before? Yeah. Last year we gave a talk on nootropics here. We covered some more of the uh, usual stuff. Um, I'm an infosec researcher and part-time pen tester out of Denver. I do a lot of independent security research. We do some pharmacological research, uh, mostly looking at trends within the industry. Um, it's important to remember, though, that I am not a doctor, and I'm certainly not your doctor. So it's very important for you to do your own research, understand the mechanisms behind how these drugs work, and decide whether or not you're willing to take the risk. Because the one thing that is clear is this is not thoroughly researched. The mechanisms of these drugs are well understood, but their use in humans, and especially their long-term use in healthy humans, has not. So throughout all of this, it seems that the same question keeps coming up over and over and over, and it is, does it make me like you? And if I offer at least a little assurance that it won't, the conversation will move forward. So in order to give credit where it's due, we have to talk about Rita Levi Montalcini. Please, please look into this woman's history. It's a fascinating story. She was the first Nobel laureate to reach 100, and she was the oldest still productive Nobel laureate to date. At 102, she was still releasing papers that are every bit as lucid and relevant as papers from her 20s. Uh, in fact, there's a famous interview I like to, to reference where she's doing a, an interview with Italian television, and they say, you know, Montalcini, do you feel that you've slowed down? Do you feel that these new scientists can outthink you? And she just got a little sparkle in her eye and smiled to him. She's like, oh, no, no, no. I'm just as lucid as I was in my 20s. The only difference is I have an entire lifetime of experience and training to draw upon. She's like, I do take more naps, though. <laughs> So she absolutely should be honored for these discoveries. She should be referenced in a lot of this stuff because if it weren't for her observations and her deduction of the mechanism behind her observations, we wouldn't have this area of research. So uh, working with uh, Stanley Cohen in the 50s, they were able to isolate NGF from uh, tumor cells. She had noticed that oftentimes with certain forms of tumors, you will have uh, great bundles of uh, nerve tissue. You'll have innervated masses that just swarm and wrap the tumors. And from looking very carefully, she was able to determine that while the, uh, the neurons had invaded most tissues, the veins, the, the muscles that had invaded most tissues, it did not invade the arteries. And so she deduced that perhaps this action was coming from something the tumors were releasing. And from that deduction, she was able to isolate NGF, neurogenic growth factor. Now, this is a peptide, a string of amino acids, that is responsible for a lot of neuron-based processes within the body. Certainly in learning and in uh, early childhood development, uh, NGF is now being researched and is uh, a large part behind the attempted head transplant 
that is going on now. If it weren't for NGF and the ability for the stimulation of neuron growth, none of that would be possible. But it took 50, or sorry, 30 years for the, the discovery to be recognized. It wasn't until 1986 that they were awarded the Nobel Prize. But what was great and is kind of telling is the individuals on the research team knew what they had. And more than one began immediately administering the drug to themselves. In fact, Montalcini famously uh, constructed eye drops and would administer NGF to the eye daily and sometimes multiple times daily for the rest of her life shortly following the discovery. Um, that's why I give her credit as a gonzo scientist here because, you know, long before she would ever get any kind of approval, she's like, mm-mm. Is, is for me. Now, if you were, if you were to, to hire a peptide lab to produce human neuro, neurogenic growth factor in a quality that was sufficient to put in your eye safely, you're looking at roughly $10,000 a month per person. So unless you're a biochemist, it's, it's a little bit prohibitive. So the, the drugs we're working on here are sort of a shortcut. They allow your body to release more NGF or BDNF or uh, GCNF or, I know, <laughs> or GCNF or BDNF. And uh, some of these act as prodrugs for these same compounds. But considering they're proteins, m the vast majority of these compounds are very fragile. And so even prodrug formation is not an option. So brain-derived nootrophic factor is probably the most active of this group. Um, you see a line of uh, nootropic drugs that are being released such as uh, lion's mane extract. The herinesions and arinesions within the extract is shown to release this type of uh, drug within the body. Now nerve growth factor of course was the uh, topic of Montalcini's original research and CNTF is interesting in that it promotes the survival of neurons much more than any kind of uh, expansion. Um, CNTF is responsible, or sorry, is capable of promoting the survival of uh, dopamine neurons even in situations where they normally would be destroyed. And so they've been able to show it have a prophylactic effect against head injury. Um, they've been using it for ischemic victims recently. And uh, there's a lot of uh, research that shows that we have just to scratch the surface of the use of these compounds. Particularly in the United States, our understanding of and our utilization of peptide-based pharmacology is in its infancy. We, we've absolutely been outshined by the rest of the world, and in particular, the former Soviet Union. So it sounds easy, right? More brain, more better. Everyone would like to just be able to have a dome head and fit as much brain in there as you can afford. It's not a big deal. But the structure of the brain is what provides its magic, not the substance. And having undifferentiated brain tissue exploding with growth inside of your head is not necessarily a constructive thing. So if you have a predisposition or a family history for any type of organic brain disease, it would be best to just sort of write off this line of experimentation having half of your brain soaked up with some, some useless tissue is not going to be good. So there have been some drugs developed in this space, particularly in the Soviet Union, as we said. So the first were uh, products of the state. And so what does the state do? They look to agricultural byproducts for their needs. And so one of the first readily available sources of these peptides was in pig brain concentrate. And exactly as it sounds, the, living, the brains from uh, recently deceased pigs were harvested, purified, and sold as a drug called cerebralicin. You can actually still purchase cerebralicin. It's totally unregulated in the United States. It's kind of fallen out of favor as some of these more advanced drugs have become available, but it absolutely is effective. And unlike some of the others, there are anecdotal reports of people with 20 years of daily administration. And so, that can, uh, that can be a real low-hanging fruit if you want to get started. This absolutely the one with the most uh, safety profile. Now, after, 
After looking to these concentrates and proving their efficacy, they are able through clinical trials to determine which portions of this protein amalgam was actually providing the, the neurological action. And so after the brain concentrates, we start to get into these structured peptide drugs. And so this is the, the group that most people are going to be familiar with. Uh, Nupept, this particular drug, very, very cheap, extremely potent in just dozens of milligrams per dosage. But uh, Nupept is uh, fairly unique within the family in that it can be stored at room temperature and can be administered orally. The vast majority of these drugs are too fragile to be administered orally. They have to be injected. And that was a reason why up until recently, and with recent advancements, their popularity had been limited. There's quite a stigma with needle-based uh, recreational drug administration here in the U.S. So, Salonk has been uh, marketed in Europe and in the former Soviet Union for almost 20 years now. Uh, it's over the counter. It's used as an anxiolytic. So these protein-based drugs, despite their uh, seemingly fragile pharmacology, have every bit the efficacy of alkaloids and, and other more traditional pharmacological agents. Salonk has an anxiolytic potential on par with low-dose benzodiazepines. Absolutely a very, very powerful uh, sedative without having uh, the ceiling with sedation. You can dose yourself with a hundred times the recommended dose of Salonk and you're not going to have an adverse health event. Now, CMAX is probably the most popular drug. This was developed again in the former Soviet Union and their, their government had, for whatever reason, an emphasis on cognitive decline research. Some have speculated that it's because of alcoholism or uh, nutritional deficiencies or what have you, but they absolutely have invested more time, more research, and more money than the United States has in maintaining the cognition of its populace. So CMAX is a potent nootropic drug, very potent. Uh, the, the action is within just moments after administration, um, very similar to some of the racetam drugs in a clearing of vision, uh, slight stimulation, verbal fluidity, uh, memory, and uh, these effects will last five, six hours. Again, because of the, the sort of ephemeral nature of these protein drugs, you could administer a hundred times the active dose and not necessarily have an adverse event. Uh, and the most adverse events are discomfort, you know, other than the sort of uh, atypical anaphylaxis that you may see. These drugs are incredibly, uh, or sorry, have a, an incredibly wide therapeutic window. So CMAX has been marketed in the United States, but because of its injection only administration, it really never caught on. And so there were various attempts to try and make CMAX uh, more bioavailable. And some of those, those uh, adjustments were the second wave. No, none of that, thank you. So, <laughs> nice try, that was good. So, we, we get into these, these structured drugs that the, the structures have been modified specifically to provide the action they want. Now, uh, N-acetyl-C-MAX was created as sort of a protection against the degradation of this peptide. Instead of having to be stored entirely under refrigeration and administered with subcutaneous injection, N-acetyl-C-MAX can be administered intranasally. And so all of a sudden, a whole group of people that would never just inject things under their skin for fun had access to it. Now, N-acetyl-C-MAX also can be stored at room temperature for periods of, you know, 40 hours or so and still be safe. So that allows a whole window of clinical administration without the, the refrigerators and various things like that, that are needed. Now, N-acetyl-C-MAX amidate is different. N-acetyl-C-MAX amidate was created with the same goal in mind to make it more bioavailable, more stable, but instead of being created by a pharmaceutical company, these were created by people in the nootropic space. This was created by individuals really with not the necessary training. There haven't been any uh, clinical studies done, but there are tons of anecdotal reports. And uh, both the uh, acetylation and the amidate make the drugs much more potent. As you would expect, if it was more bioavailable, the same dosage is gonna provide more action. But also, because they're more stable, you see longer 
uh, durations of action for these drugs. Um, and acetyl C-max is very stimulatory. You can be completely worn out, ready to go to bed and have a dosage and be awake as if you had used uh, a more traditional stimulant. Again, the dosage window is incredibly broad. You're not going to have these sort of overstimulation adverse effects and you don't really develop a tolerance. There's individuals who have been using this drug for about five years now since it was invented or at least distributed to the public. And again, they say no development of tolerance even with somewhat less than responsible use. So. <clears throat> That brings us to where we kind of are at today. We're getting to the point where individuals who are operating in this space with no oversight are being provided with the resources to, to push this research forward, but without the, the institutions of traditional pharmaceutical research. So what we're having are people reading mice studies. We have people that are looking at animal-based reports and they're extrapolating that research and producing a drug, getting it out to the world to the lowest bidder and then distributing it wholesale to the, the greedy public. And so we have drugs not only like the N-acetyl C-max amidate but P21. This isn't just a more bioavailable alteration to an already tested drug. This is a peptide sequ sequence shown to have efficacy in animal studies and then um, 20 years go by, some individual with a peptide-based nootropics company in the U.S. sees it, has it developed and starts distributing it to people with a not for human consumption caveat. So there, there seems to be quite a almost institutional naivete that has pervaded the nootropic scene. These aren't necessarily your traditional drug people that, that are used to not trusting their suppliers. And so there's a, there's a lot of room for problems. And so I think that before this is all said and done, perhaps not with the peptide drugs, but the nootropics industry is certainly going to have a wake-up call as there's just uh, people are becoming more and more bold and more and more products which have never been tested in, in humans, let, I mean in primates, let alone humans, are just being released and people are taking them each and every day. Uh, something that I think is important to remember even with this class of drugs are there is no biochemical free lunch. There's nothing you're going to be able to do each and every day that is not going to have a lasting effect on your body or isn't going to downregulate in some way. Now, uh, I know that's kind of contrary to the you aren't going to develop a tolerance, but that's based more on broad experience than this particular class of drugs. So delta sleep inducing peptide is an interesting one that's only recently become available in, outside of research markets, and it's been shown in rodent studies to induce uh, spindle forms on EEGs with almost as soon as it's induced. And so they're looking at this using it for a deep restorative sleep or for people to use it to consolidate memories. Um, again, anecdotal only. This has never been tested in humans and you, you certainly couldn't uh, stretch it to say things are safe. Now, Apitalon is really unique here and I'd like to mention it because unlike the others, this one has an action, action on uh, telomerase. Telomeres at the end of your genetic material that help sort of soup up the damage that, that has happened to your DNA over time shorten and shorten. And there's some, some pretty strong correlation between telomere length and the overall age of an animal, or at least how well it's aging. And so this is one of the very few drugs that has been shown to interact with telomeres without just inducing tumor growth immediately. Because as you know, keeping cells alive after they don't want to be alive anymore is not necessarily a constructive thing to do. So again, they've, uh, within the nootropics industry, they have made acetylated and amidate versions. And these drugs are pretty cheap, thing, all things considered. Um, there are suppliers that are domestic within the U.S. that are being, they're producing the proteins within the U.S. And so there's a certain degree of safety that people think is assumed because of the broad dosage windows and what have you. But these drugs are absolutely untested and it's important to keep that in mind throughout. So I want to give us a little, some time for questions here. So if anyone wants to get a hold of me, here's the information. I just want you all to remember, only users, or sorry, only losers use drugs. <laughs> All right. Go use the mic, man. Unless you want to shout. Thank you.
What do you take of all of these things, if any? What do I think or what do I take? What do you take? Uh, I'm not taking any at this time, but I think if you were going to choose just one, if you had to pick just one to experiment with, it would be CMAX. CMAX has had you know, hundreds of millions of individual doses administered to individual people, and it has a very broad window of action. So I personally enjoy it. I think it's a, a better stimulant than caffeine. It's much easier on your system. And should you administer some and then need to go to sleep, it's absolutely possible. And so CMAX, uh, you're looking at about $60 to $70 per person per month. So it's not necessarily a cheap choice, and it has to be stored under refrigeration unless you buy some of the, the newer modified versions. All right. Anything else? What do you think about the administration of the nasal? Because like C-Max um, and some of them go nasal, and there's the injection as well. Oh, I absolutely think that the pharmacology is distinct. Uh, intranasal administration produces different results than subcutaneous administration. And so there are some researchers and certainly nootropics enthusiasts that prefer intranasal administration. But uh, for me, and this was the horrible caveat that kept me from actually using CMAX long term, is it produced anosmia, like very strong anosmia. I had no sense of smell for probably four months after I had stopped entirely. And I could smell coffee, I could smell food, but like real subtle biological odors, like I couldn't smell my wife, I couldn't tell if my, my kids were in the room. It was, it was disturbing enough to, to not warrant any further experimentation. So I've spoken with other researchers who haven't had that problem, but it was enough to scare me off. You doing, brother? Just a question. Um, speaking of uh, the, the aeronasiums and the uh, henryasiums, um, have you done any uh, research into the other uh, supposed uh, fungal families that have been shown to regrow uh, neuron? Oh, or, yeah. Should oh, I, yeah. Should in I fact, email you? In so, please do. Okay. In fact, uh, certain strains of reishi, particularly the red reishi, have been shown to be even more potent releasers of NGF and BDNF. And so uh, th some of the issues that you have with high dose BDNF and NGF supplementation, or at least, you know, excreta log supplementation, is that you'll begin to get formication with high doses. You'll have uh, ant crawling sensation or tingles over your head and on your skin. And that can, be, that can be a sign that you're overdoing it. But again, there's still even further nootropic action once you've, you know, become accustomed to that. Uh, the, the NGF, or uh, the Aradesians, no. The, the lion's mane mushroom extracts, specifically the Aranesians and Heranesiones, are again uh, shown to provide long-lasting effects even after you stop. If you take it for a year and this is how you feel, that's pretty much how you're going to stay, which is highly distinct from the racetams, which constantly are reaching into different plateaus of action and then stepping back down without any real changes. So uh, yeah, I would... Uh, the formication thing is a bit of an issue, and we've spoken with individuals who have said that with high dose supplementation of NGF and BDNF substances, they've overwritten their childhood memories. That they've, they've studied for six years in some medical field or some research field, and at the end of it, they did well, they feel intelligent, but as they start to reflect back, everything from 16 or before is gone. And so, yeah, and there's some research that shows th there may be an NGF-based mechanism. That may be why you can't remember your really early childhood. Not because it's locked behind some psychological block, but because you've used that space up and re reconfigured uh, it to store later memories. So uh, with Nupept in particular, I just wanted to mention this one, uh, Nupept, the reason I never experimented with Nupept past sort of an initial getting to know you phase was after about six weeks of supplementation, I was looking in the mirror at one point and didn't uh, recognize my reflection. I knew who I was, but when I tried to stop and think like, what do I look like? My, uh, my residual self-image had been overwritten or at least interfered with in some way. And so again, that was enough to go like, no, uh, I'm not, mm, it's not worth it. So new Pept, again, is really cheap. A year's supply is gonna run you $5. So this experimentation is, is very accessible even to those with very little resources. So thank you guys.